The next objection we're talking about, the next evidentiary objection we're talking about is a huge one, objection hearsay. I think this is probably a number one for the one that people doing mock trial think they understand, uh, but know only a sliver of. Uh, they think uh, hearsay very narrowly, and I can tell you when we cover hearsay in a full-on law school four-credit course, we cover it for weeks. It has more than 30 exceptions to it. Uh, it's very complicated and it has a lot going on. It's always tested on an evidence exam and it's always tested on the bar exam. So it's a huge, huge topic. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you what you need to know. And that's really arguing the definition of hearsay. If you understand what the definition is, so therefore as the opponent, what you're looking out for, when you're going to throw the flag, when you're going to ring the buzzer to say these words and stand up objection hearsay, what are you listening for as the opponent? And then I'm going to teach you just in the definition, not worry about the 30 exceptions just yet, just in the definition, say, here's the stuff you can say as the proponent. Here's the stuff you can respond to this evidentiary objection of hearsay. So let's start with the definition. And again, it's in the federal rules 801C. Uh, and it's very, very simple. It's three parts, but it hits upon a foundational topic that we'll talk about with respect to lots of other rules of evidence. And that is the rules of evidence and an objection, an evidentiary objection under the rules often turns on the opponent standing up and saying they're trying to do something that is not allowed. The proponent is trying to get at testimony or introduce evidence that's not allowed under the rules. And mainly it's not allowed for this bad purpose. Okay, so you're actually objecting by saying, here's the elements of the objection, but also included in those uh, uh, elements is that they're trying to do this for the reasons that the rules envision. They're trying to do this for the bad purposes under those rules. So very naturally, the proponent, when they disengage from the witness examination, turn to the court, talk through the court, one of the responses is always going to be, this does not meet that definition this is not improper and prescribed by the rules and mainly because i'm not introducing it for that bad purpose i have some other purpose and you'll see that repeatedly so it really has to do with what's really going on why are they really asking these questions why are they really introducing this evidence the proponent the one that's presenting the ones up putting on evidence so hearsay is no exception and it's a big one it's basically saying you're trying to bring in some quote some quote bubble that someone said outside of this court. You're trying to bring in a statement, not a question, uh, not some non-assertion, an actual statement that someone else said outside of this court, and you're trying to bring it in here through someone else, through some other witness. So Bobby said something out in town that Sarah burned down the building, and we're trying to bring in Bobby's statement, his out of court statement, that Sarah burned down the building, we're trying to bring it into court through not Bobby, not Bobby as the witness, some other witness. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask that witness, we're going to say, what did Bobby say? So right away, when you hear what did Bobby say, we're going to, as the opponent, have our ears ready, have our evidence sensors going off and say, that sounds an awful lot like a question that calls for this witness here to say, what Bobby said out of court, some statement, and for that bad purpose. They're introducing it not for some other innocuous purpose, not for something that's allowed, but instead for the truth of what's in those quotes that Sarah burned on the building. They're offering it. That antiquated phrase, truth of the matter asserted, comes in from the common law. It's codified in all the rules of evidence. And really what it means is they're trying to prove the words that are in quotes. They're trying to prove that Sarah burned down the building. That's why they want it. So objection hearsay. And what am I saying when I say objection hearsay as the opponent, the one charged with objecting? I'm saying they're doing something that meets this definition. It's an out of court. It's a statement. And they're offering it for that bad purpose to prove what's in quotes. And I can stand up any time at trial that I believe that. Uh, so now let's talk about what the proponent might say in response. So here you go, you have your definition. Any time that someone stands up in the middle of trial, no matter how complicated the trial, no matter how involved it is, and they say objection hearsay as the attorney, as the opponent, the one charged with objecting, that means they're saying we have one of those things. We have that 801C definition of an out of court statement for truth of the matter asserted, that bad purpose. So it goes to the proponent. 
the one that was asking the questions of a witness, the one that was on direct examination or on cross-examination, asking questions, up presenting, up putting on evidence. They have to disengage from the witness. They have to turn to the court, not all the way to their opponent, talk through the court, and they have to respond. And oftentimes, the way they respond turns on that third element, that most controversial element. What is my purpose for doing this? Right. And you can see that uh, one of the elements that the opponent is standing up and objecting to, one of the elements is you're doing something for the wrong reasons. So I'm the proponent. I'm going to stand up and I'm saying I'm not doing it for any bad purpose. I'm doing it for some other purpose. So for my money, I'm going to go to the definition if I'm responding. Even if I have no idea what to say, someone breaks my rhythm and says objection hearsay. I'm going to turn from the witness. I'm going to turn to the court. I'm going to talk through the court. Your Honor. This is not hearsay. Those are going to be the first words out of my mouth. They're saying objection hearsay meets this definition. I'm saying this is not hearsay. It doesn't meet this definition. And why? Because of that controversial third element. It's not because I'm not offering it for the truth of the matter asserted. Instead, I'm offering it for some other purpose. And notice I got a sentence or two that I can say before, while I think of what that other purpose is. And I mentioned that there were 30 objections were obviously are exceptions to the rule. We're not going to go over the 30 exceptions to the rule, but notice how you'd respond if an, an objection, uh, an exception to the rule applied. I would say, Your Honor, while this is hearsay, an exception applies. It is. Uh, it's an excited utterance or under 8032, or it's a statement made for purposes of medical diagnosis under 8034. You'd have to learn the particulars of those rules and talk them with your team, but you're responding the same way. I'm prepared to turn and say, this is not hearsay and here's why, or if it is hearsay, an exception applies as the proponent. I'm going to give you a little bonus coverage right now. Uh, I have lots of evidence videos that are on the YouTube channel. So if you get into this or you're trying to prep for an evidence course that is in your future or an evidence test like that part of the bar, uh, you can look at a bunch of other videos. But for me, definitionally, uh, if it's not for the truth of the matter asserted, it's usually. Here's the, uh, the, the layout again that we just talked about in the last slide. Uh, if I'm the opponent and I'm charged with objecting and I hear something that looks like we're dragging in someone else's quote, we're dragging in someone else's quote bubble. Maybe it's a memo that someone else wrote and I'm trying to introduce it into evidence. Objection. Uh, hearsay. That memo written on the outside is an out of court statement and you're offering it to prove exactly what's in that memo, the content of that memo. So you're offering it for the bad purpose, the truth of the matter asserted. I'm going to object hearsay. Same thing with um, what did Bobby say to you or what did you learn from talking to Bobby or come away from a conversation with Bobby? What was your understanding? All these veiled ways that we try to ask questions that call for hearsay. You're going to, as the opponent, stand up and object hearsay. As the proponent, as we talked about, Your Honor, this is not hearsay. It's not offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Instead, I'm offering it for some other purpose. And here's kind of a top five of what those other purposes are. You'll hear these things said in court. You'll even hear them on TV and the movies if they're trying to be accurate. But really, if I'm the proponent and I'm asking a question of a witness that has to do with maybe that memo on the outside or maybe Bobby's statement, it's not hearsay if I'm introducing it for one of these purposes. That is, I don't really care about the truth. I don't care about the content in quotes. I'm offering it for some other purpose. And if I have these at the ready, probably one of them uh, might apply to your situation if you're trying to do it on the fly. So I would say, Your Honor, this is not hearsay. I'm not offering it for the truth of the matter asserted. Instead, I'm offering it for its effect on the hearer. I'm offering it for circumstantial evidence of the declarant state of mind. I'm offering it to demonstrate credibility and impeachment. Uh, I don't necessarily care which version is true, just that this person says different things on this day. I'm offering it because it's a legal act or a verbal act. That is, it's a, uh, has independent legal significance. Or I'm offering it, again, not because it's true or not, but to show that whoever heard it uh, has knowledge of it or is on notice of it. So I don't have a ton of time to go through each one of these, but just know for the 10 seconds on each, you could be offering something. You don't care what was said over the radio to the cop. You only care that based on what the, the, the police officer heard, they proceeded to a specific place and to a specific scene. So your honor, I'm not offering this. It's not hearsay, I'm not offering this for the truth of what was said. Instead, I'm offering it for the effect it had on the hearer, why the officer proceeded to that particular location. That what's in quotes, 
doesn't matter. What was said over the CB doesn't matter. What mattered was what did the police officer do next? So it's it's to get the story along to show the effect it had on whoever was listening to that out of court statement. Not for a bad purpose. That's an acceptable purpose. Um, circumstantial state of mind is a tough one for the declarant, but if someone were saying something where they were, um, oh my God, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse, I'm, I'm offering that not to show, the, to prove the truth that someone's that hungry or that, that they would actually eat a horse. I'm offering it because that circumstantial evidence can show something about what's going on in that person's mind, that they were famished at the time. So I can, I can make an argument that there's circumstantial evidence gained from that statement to show what was going on in someone's head. Uh, I was so scared, I nearly uh, uh, wet myself. Well, you know, I'm not trying to prove that someone wet themselves. I'm trying to show what's going on in that person's mind. And it happens, has to do with traditional states of mind. If they're, if they're having a kind of mental health issues, they have something going on, it's to prove that. Impeachment's an interesting one. When I try to show that somebody said different things on different days, they said the light was red on this day. They said the light was turning uh, yellow to green on this day. Well, I'm entitled to ask those questions about the differences because I'm not trying to prove the truth of either statement. I'm trying to prove under equally reliable circumstances that this declarant says different things on different days. So it's for credibility for impeachment. That's an acceptable purpose, a good purpose for which I can introduce this. Legal act is something that has legal significance. Like I offer you $200 to buy your bicycle. Well, that's an offer and an offer has legal uh, significance under contract law. So it might be, um, that's the reason it's offered not to prove the truth of uh, the $200 value. And uh, Joe went into the store owner and told him that the sidewalk was really wet. It doesn't really matter. I'm not trying to prove that the sidewalk was wet. I'm trying to prove that he put the store owner on notice or the store owner had knowledge. So these are other purposes that the proponent could use. Objection hearsay, Your Honor, this is not hearsay, not offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Instead, I'm offering it for one of these other five purposes. I'm offering it for impeachment. I'm offering it for state of mind. I'm offering it because it provides notice of the store owner. The next one, and this too is a big one, is objection improper character. So who better for, if we're talking about bad character, who better than Gargamel himself? So improper character is also under Article 4 and some of the objections we talked about before with objection irrelevant and the dangers of 403 with objection improper. Uh, unfairly prejudicial. Improper character, I want you to think about if you're bringing up kind of bad acts uh, of, you know, bad stuff in someone's past, it objection improper character if it has to do with someone who's a character in this story, uh, the criminal defendant, the victim, a party in a civil case, someone who's one of the main characters of the story. If you're just talking about a witness, no other connection about a than a witness, and it's bad stuff about a witness, it's going to be for the next objection that we'll talk about under Article 6, which is objection improper impeachment. If I'm talking bad stuff about the witness, it's probably, I'm going to view that as whether it's a proper or improper impeachment or not. Improper character is when I'm talking about all the characters in the play. The biggest one that the rules envision, the criminal defendant, the victim in a criminal case, or parties in a civil case sometimes. So objection, improper character is the next one we're talking about. So here we go again. We have uh, what the opponent would say, and here's the times when they would say it. What I like to do for this one is I like to draw the four corners of a case. So we talked earlier in, in this part, part eight, evidentiary objections. We talked about, you know, maybe that car accident, very simple mock trial fact pattern having to do with a car accident on July 23rd. Well, there's going to be certain things that kind of fit within the four corners of that case. And maybe it's not just July 23rd. Maybe there's some days before that, um, you know, show something going on. Maybe there's some follow on in the days after what people said and what they did. But really, the four corners of the case is pretty neatly defined. And then all of a sudden in a mock trial pattern, just like you'll have some things that are wholly irrelevant, like we talked about with uh, the person getting fired and, and getting fired for being late all the time from a telemarketing job. And you're going to have some things that are just unfairly prejudicial that stick out as, as really kind of gruesome or unfair or uh, doesn't seem fair. Uh, and then there's sort of like 
something that's way outside of the four corners of the case that's just bad news about one of the characters in the case. So if it's a criminal defendant and he's uh, charged with uh, stealing from convenience stores, all of a sudden they're going to have that 10 years earlier he used to uh, steal from ATMs. So it's kind of similar, it's kind of uh, like it, but it's 10 years removed. So if you were drawing the four corners of the case, you'd say, that's way out of bounds. That's way in the past. And of course, it's relevant. You, you'd you want to, as the proponent, introduce it because someone who used to steal from ATMs all the time, it's probably more likely that they committed this burglary, committed this robbery, than if you didn't have it. So that's what relevance is. It's more likely, more probative because you have it. And the bad purpose, so we just talked about under hearsay, the bad purpose was offered for the truth of the matter asserted for, to prove the contents of what's in quotes. Well, character evidence, it's for propensity. And what that means is because they did this one thing in the past, it must have mean they always do it. It must mean they did it in this case. So you can think about our robbery burglary example, the person robbing convenience stores. Um, you'd want to put in that evidence, the other bad stuff about knocking over ATMs 10 years earlier, it's outside the four corners. So you have your sensors up as to, oh, this could be one of those improper character objections. And why are they introducing it? Why does the proponent want this in? If I'm the opponent, the one charged with objecting, I'm saying, well, if they want it in for the bad purpose, they want to show once a thief, always a thief. He was probably a thief in this case with a convenience store. So I would stand up as soon as I see it coming and I'm going to know it's coming because the same mock trial fact pattern that I have, they have that shows the 10 years early, um, uh, you know, theft of ATMs. So when they start to look like they're getting into ATMs, I'm ready to say objection, improper character. And really what I'm saying when I stand up and say objection, talk through the court, objection, improper character, I'm saying there's some other bad stuff outside the four corners of this case about one of the characters, criminal defendant, victim, party in a civil case, and they're doing it for the bad purpose. They're doing it for propensity. So if I have one sentence to argue to the judge, objection, improper character. This is improper character of the criminal defendant trying to show that he has a propensity uh, to steal. That's enough. You're, you're objecting, you're, you're offering objection, you're offering a valid basis. Well, the proponent, of course, would have something to say. And like we've been talking about, if it's objection, proponents trying to do this thing for the bad purpose, one of the things you can almost picture two hands going up in the air, like the innocent face, the proponent's going to disengage from that witness examination, going to turn not all the way to the opponent, but turn to the court, talk through the court, your honor. This is not some type of other bad act, some bad stuff that's outside it. This is about this case. You know, this is this is closer in time than 10 years old. This is this is not other stuff. This is this stuff when they were running away from committing the convenience store robbery in this case. Well, they committed some property damage while they were leaving. It's all part of the same event. It's not other stuff. It's this fact. Or if it is something that's 10 years older, you can say I'm not offering it for the bad purpose. I'm not offering it for propensity. Instead, I'm offering it for some other purpose. So notice it's the same flavor as the hearsay response, the evidentiary response that a proponent would have to a hearsay objection. They want to say objection, improper character. They're doing this and they're doing it for the bad purpose. You are you want to say, I'm not doing that or I'm not doing that for the bad purpose. And there's a different rule. This is rule 404 that covers some of these prescriptions. 404B has a whole list of other purposes and that's intent and motive and plan. So I'm not offering um, these ATM robberies from 10 years ago as propensity to show that he's once a thief, always a thief. I'm doing it to show that there was not a mistake in this case or the lack of absence or absence of mistake, or I'm doing it to show that he did, he could have the requisite intent if he's claiming this was all a big accident, all a big misunderstanding. So those are the two arguments. And for mock trial, really, it's just understand the dance of the arguments, understand what you would say as the opponent when you object, when something like these old outside of the four corners uh, ATM robberies are in your fact pattern and understand as the proponent, when you're getting into it, you better have a response. I'm asking, did you have some problems uh, with ATMs uh, before? Didn't you have some problems 10 years before? Objection, improper character. I disengage with my right hand from the examination. I turn to the court, your honor, this is not offered for propensity. Instead, it's offered to establish uh, the intent of the defendant in this case. 
objection overruled, objection sustained, and then you move on. At least you understood the evidentiary challenge.